Hi, welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today we are going to talk about rock types and the rock cycle. So let's get into it. Okay, so the story of rocks. There are three types of main rocks. There is igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Each of the different rocks tell us something about our environment. So for instance, igneous rocks tell us about tectonic setting and cooling history, whereas sedimentary rocks are gonna tell us something about the surface of the environment and the energy of the environment. Okay, and then metamorphic rocks will tell us something about an original rock type, the pressure and temperature conditions at which it formed, and the degree of its change. We can classify these things by pretty similar methods. Um, igneous rocks are classified by composition and texture. Sedimentary rocks are classified by chemical composition and grain size. And then metamorphic rocks are classified by composition, mineral makeup, and texture. And we're going to go through each of the rock types individually. Okay, so first up is igneous. So igneous means fire. So all of the igneous rocks are formed from some sort of molten rock, some sort of molten lava. So they can either be erupted out of a volcano, like this picture here, which we then call volcanic igneous rocks, or we call them extrusive because they have exited the earth. They formed outside um, on the surface. Or they can solidify underground in something called a pluton, which is a body of magma that has solidified underground over thousands or millions of years. Um, and we call these either plutonic igneous rocks or intrusive because they formed inside the earth. All right, so let's look at some textures. So this is kind of text heavy, but we'll go through them individually. So first, when we're trying to identify an igneous rock, the first thing we want to look at is texture. So textures of an igneous rock are fine grain, coarse grain, vesicular, glassy, pyroclastic. Okay. The first one you usually notice is either fine grained or coarse grained. Do you see big crystals or do you not see big crystals? Okay. So texture is not how the rock feels. It's how the crystals are arranged. So in a fine grain igneous rock, we're not going to see very many crystals without a microscope. In microscope, you will be able to see the crystals. Um, but to the naked eye, you won't be able to see very many of them. They are going to be interlocking. So it's going to be a very solid, hard rock. Okay, the cooling rate here is quickly above the surface. And that's important when we're talking about crystal size because the faster a rock cools or faster crystal cools, crystallizes, the smaller it's going to be. Crystals take time to grow. So if they cool over a very long period of time, they will grow large. If they cool, cool really quickly at the surface, they're not going to grow very big. So usually the origin here is volcanic. Okay, then we get into the coarse grain, which is where we can see large interlocking crystals like this diorite here. Okay, these are cooling slowly below the surface. So rocks that form in a pluton will cool over thousands of years and eventually crystallize into larger crystals because they had more time to grow. So the origin here is plutonic and the rocks are cooling slowly below the surface. Okay, then we get into vesicular. Vesicular is pretty interesting because there are no visible crystals, but there are a lot of holes in the rock. So this is a pumice, which is a volcanic igneous rock that is made mostly of actually volcanic glass, but there's so many holes you can't really tell that it's glass. All those holes are fossilized bubbles, essentially. Eventually, when the rock cools, all of that gas can escape, and then you're left with just holes in the rock. Okay, this cools really quickly above the surface. Then we get into glassy, which is a texture that obsidian will show you. So this is a piece of obsidian. Uh, I forgot to mention this fine grain up here is a basalt. Um, so obsidian will cool very quickly, almost immediately, because it is not forming any crystals and all you see is this very smooth structure. So this is basically volcanic glass as well, but this does not have any gas bubbles left over. So this is a nice smooth texture. Then we get into pyroclastic, which is, I like to try to help students remember it by remembering that pyro means fire and clastic means clasts 
of rock or pieces of rock essentially. So we've got anything made from fire and pieces of rock. So it's mostly all ash. Sometimes you get remnants of crystals and rocks from the inside of the magma chamber during the eruption. Um, and these cool very quickly at the surface as well. Um, they're volcanic in nature, so they come out of a volcano. Um, and you don't usually see a lot of crystals, except for sometimes you'll see some randomly. Um, and it's composed mostly of ash from the eruption. All right, so let's look at some special igneous textures here. Um, porphyritic is a rock that consists of two distinct crystal sizes. If they're fine grained, you have one visible crystal size and one that's microscopic. So like in this example here, we have a fine grained porphyritic rock. So the black crystals were crystallizing prior to eruption, most likely in the magma chamber. So they had more time to grow larger so that we can actually see them without a microscope. The rest of it, the matrix, which is this gray stuff in here around these tabular crystals that would have cooled outside of the magma chamber and it didn't grow very the crystals didn't grow very big so they're microscopic but because there's two distinct crystal sizes here we call it a porphyritic rock and coarse grained there it is our coarse grained porphyritic is going to have both of the crystals visible but one of them is going to be notably larger so here we have these feldspars which are kind of like a salmon color these are notably larger than the rest of the crystals in the rock, right? So this would be a coarse grain porphyritic. You can see all the crystals, but one of the crystal sizes is notably larger than the rest. All right, moving on to sedimentary rocks. These form at or near the Earth's surface. And in fact, 80% of the Earth's surface is covered in sedimentary rocks. But sedimentary rocks only make up 5% of the rocks in the Earth's crust. So most of these rocks you're seeing at the surface, most of the rocks when you walk outside are going to be sedimentary rocks. Okay, so the making of a sedimentary rock involves quite a bit of steps, but we'll break them down individually. So the first step is weathering and erosion. So we're breaking pre-existing rocks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Erosion will then carry those pieces away and this can be done by wind, water, or ice. And then deposition, we will deposit these things somewhere after they've been transported from the original location. And then in that depositional environment, they will be compacted and cemented together. So compaction occurs when more and more sediment accumulates on top of existing sediment and compresses the sediment deeper and deeper. And then eventually a cementing agent will come in and actually cement the rock together and form from just pieces of rock into a sol solidified rock, essentially. So if we combine both compaction and cementation, we use a term called lithification um, to kind of combine those two processes together. So the first step is is weathering, right? So physical weathering and chemical weathering are the two weathering processes we can see. Physical weathering is the breakdown into smaller and smaller pieces. Okay, we're just getting smaller and smaller here. We're not changing anything about the rock. So one of them is frost wedging. So when rocks crack, they leave open spaces for water to intrude. Water intrudes and it's in an area where water will freeze and thaw rapidly you will see something called frost wedging, where water in the cracks in rock will freeze and expand and break the rock apart. And then that essentially weathers the rock. Then we have root wedging, which does similar things. So a tree or something growing in a rock will be looking for nutrients in those cracks because like I said, water can get in those cracks. Water contains nutrients for plant life. So you will oftentimes see roots in trees and other plants working its way through the cracks that it can find and then eventually growing and breaking those rocks apart. 
And then we have unloading, which is a great reduction in pressure when overlying rock is eroded away. So this is kind of hard to explain, but let me kind of break it down for you. So below the surface, if there is a pluton below the surface, there is pressure on all sides of that pluton. So I have a paper bag here and I have pressure on all sides of the paper bag. Let's pretend that the paper bag is a pluton. Now, uh, as time extends, we see the erosion of the overburdened rock, so the rock on top of the pluton, and sometimes we get uplift in things that brings this pluton to the surface. And when that happens, there's a release in pressure. And what happens when I release the pressure on the paper bag? I'm sorry, plastic bag. It expands, right? So the expansion is what occurs to a rock as well, and that expansion allows for cracking and breaking of the rock. All right, and then we move into chemical weathering, which is where rocks have been changed, one or more chemical component of the rock has been changed by the processes that have weathered it. So the first one we see here is oxidation. So this is otherwise known as rust. You've probably seen this before. Anything containing iron will rust, and so will rocks if the minerals contain iron. So <clears throat> here you'll see a notable kind of orange color to the rock, and that will give you an indication that there has been some chemical change in the iron-bearing silicates and has turned to a rust color or oxidized. Then we have dissolution, which occurs a lot in a rock called limestone. This is when we have acidic waters that will dissolve basically the limestone. So limestone is a calcium carbonate rich, which is a basic type of chemical composition. And anything slightly acidic can break that down pretty easily. So like when you take uh, Tums, for instance, is calcium carbonate based, and you usually use that in when you have acid reflux because it helps balance the pH of your throat, right, in your stomach acids. And so that's kind of what's happening here is the interaction of limestone or Tums with acidic waters or your acid reflux or your acid in your stomach. And then hydrolysis is weathering due to water. So Fortunately, there are a lot of silicate minerals that are unstable at Earth's surface, and then eventually those will form into or weather into clay minerals that are more stable, like kaolinite. So here we have a plagioclase feldspar that is weathered into a kaolinite, which is more of a clay type mineral. All right, transportation, I talked about a little bit. Gravity does transport from like the top of a cliff to the bottom. Um, that's pretty much all it does. And then we see wind, water, and ice kind of take over. Um, ice can transport the largest particles um, because like we see a glacier here can pick up pretty large boulders and take it over vast landscapes. Um, water would be the next. Water is probably one of the biggest transportation agents. And then wind can only carry sand sized particles or smaller. And gravity obviously can carry anything, but only so far. Okay, so once all of the rocks are weathered and eroded, they transform into what we call soil or sediment. Um, depending on what you read, sometimes soil and sediment are used interchangeably, um, especially nowadays. So just kind of keep that in mind. You might see the term used to mean basically the same thing. Um, so soil is anything that's naturally occurring and unconsolidated loose covering. Okay, so most of what you see outside in Fresno, Clovis, this, the Central Valley area is going to be soil or sediment. You won't necessarily see rock because it takes a cementing agent to create the rock, okay? So let's talk about a couple of different types. So these are the main four sizes of sediment grains. So the biggest would be gravel, and then that's kind of broken down into smaller boulder, cobble, pebble, or pea-sized gravels. Um, and then we have sand, which could be coarse, medium, and fine. Silt, which can also be coarse, medium, and fine. And then clay, we just kind of see coarse or fine. So clay would be the smallest size particle, and gravel is the largest. Okay, so let's think about it for one second. 
we have a photo here on the left. So we have a sediment A and a sediment B. So we have two types of sediment. Which one would be found closest to the source? So remember, closest to the source is just after it has weathered. It hasn't been transported anywhere. It's just weathered. Okay, so which one would be closer to the source, A or B? It should be B, right? So the further you get from a source rock or a weathering area, the smaller the sediment sizes are going to become. So the more it tumbles, the more it rolls, the smaller and smaller the particles will become. So which one would be found furthest from the source? That would be A, and B would be closest, because right after the rock is weathered, it's going to be the largest it will ever be until it hits its depositional area. And once it hits the depositional area, it should be the smallest it'll become. Okay, so between those two grain size, which one, um, which grain size would you suspect they would be? So A would be a what? A sand. And B would be gravel. Okay. So as the grains are being transported, they're not only becoming smaller, they're also becoming more round. So as the rock sediment tumbles, you will take it from an angular piece that has just weathered off of the existing rock into a subangular, subrounded, into all the way around it. So most of the pebbles that you saw in here, most of the gravels were pretty round, and then sediment, or sorry, sand grains are generally fairly round. As they move further from the source, you also see sorting occur. So as material is moving, the larger pieces will drop out because they're harder to move. And so eventually when you get further from the source, you're going to see mostly all the same grain size left. Okay, so you'll see something called well sorted. So sorting is the arrangement of sizes of the grains. So something is poorly sorted, if there's a lot of different grain sizes. It's well sorted if they're all the same grain size. So this is like sorting your socks. So your socks are poorly sorted if there's a bunch of different colors and a bunch of different sizes just thrown in the drawer. But if you have sorted all of them into size and color and then folded them together neatly in the drawer, then they would be very well sorted, right? All of the small ones that are green are gonna be right here. All of the big ones that are red are going to be over here. So they're well sorted. It's the same thing with sediment. We're talking about the arrangement of the size of the grains. Okay, and then lithification is the last step. So after deposition occurs, the class are going to drop out and settle in an area. And that's when compaction starts to occur. So we see more and more sediments accumulate above. And it's forcing those grains to compact and press down together. Now, this is natural compaction. This isn't we've got some sort of uh, tractor out there trying to compact the grains, okay? This is a naturally occurring process. And then eventually, we either have some sort of groundwater that moves through, or maybe this was deposited below the ocean floor, and there's a cementing agent that fills in the gaps to cement it together. Okay, so, so cementing agents we might see are siliceous cement, carbonate cement, or iron rich cement. So most of the silica and calcium carbonate are going to be found below um, in marine environments and these are coming from shells and then the iron rich are coming from groundwater um, interaction with the sediment that has been deposited and the minerals that will be deposited between the grains. Okay so classifying the sedimentary rocks we will take them either into a detrital sedimentary rocks, which are clastic sedimentary rocks, so they have some sort of gravel, sand, or silt, or clay in them, or they could be chemical sedimentary rocks. So these might have be made out of shelled critters, or they might be um, crystallized in a cave or something like that. Okay, um, we won't do a ton of identification in this class, um, but just keep in mind this is kind of where these come from. So for instance, this one on the upper left here is a conglomerate. It has a lot of rounded gravels in it. So this is a conglomerate. This one here has sand sized particles in it. So it is a sandstone. And you'd be able to feel this if you had it in hand specimen. You'd run your fingers or your hand over it and it would feel kind of like sandpaper. 
And then this one on the upper left is a coquina, which is made up of shelled fragments that are composed of calcium carbonate. So if you took some hydrochloric acid in lab and put it on the sample, it would react with the acid because it's made up of calcium carbonate, which is that base I was talking about. So it's is similar to limestone, but it's mostly shells and limestone starts to become more compact and turns more into um, kind of like a powder. All right, and then the last rock type is metamorphic rocks. So metamorphic rocks are transformed by heat and pressure. So any heat and pressure applied to a rock will transform it into a metamorphic rock. And they can be um, made from the sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or their further alteration of existing metamorphic rocks. All right, so the metamorphic process. So metamorphism occurs between 10 and 50 kilometers at depth. Okay, so when we get past 10 kilometers, that's when we see the felsic or the light colored minerals in a rock start to crisp, or sorry, start to melt. And so we see the alteration of those at that depth. And then at 50 kilometers, we start to see full melting of the rock. So they stay solid during metamorphism. So they become kind of molten and kind of like a laffy taffy between 10 and 50 kilometers. And so at 10 kilometers, the felsic minerals start to become like laffy taffy. And then at 50, they're eventually melting. So right in that area, we can see the actual alteration into a metamorphic rock. Past 50 kilometers, it turns into an igneous rock. So if it melts, it's igneous. Okay, and here heat is the most important agent because it drives recrystallization that creates new stable minerals. Okay, and the pressure that is applied to these rocks can either be applied in all directions or it can be applied differentially. So we can see confining pressure, which is all directions and just making things smaller and smaller, or we can see pressure from just two sides. So like when two um, tectonic plates are colliding, there's pressure from two specific sides, right? So those two specific sides will cause a lot of bending and folding in the rocks and then eventually give us something called foliation, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, the sources of heat we might see to try to generate the change of these rocks um, would be intruding magma. So like from a magma chamber, anything that comes in contact with that magma chamber will alter. And then we also see it in friction between moving bodies of rock. So like a continental continental collision or oceanic continental collision. Anytime we see two tectonic plates converging. Okay. So we also have something called the geothermal gradient, which is as we move deeper and deeper into the earth's crust, we see a temperature and pressure increasing which temperature increases at approximately 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer you move in the move down in the earth. Okay, so like I said, when we talked about differential stress or directed pressure, so the confining pressure, like I said, we just take a rock, all pressure is a side is from all sides, and we just see a smaller and smaller rock created. But if we take a rock and apply stress from just two areas or directed pressure from two sides, we're going to see a lot of bending and folding. So we see folding in the rock and minerals that orient, reorient themselves perpendicular to that stress, but they will all be parallel to each other. So we get this thing called foliation, which are when the minerals recrystallize perpendicular to the stress. So this is perpendicular. And they end up parallel to each other. So if we take an existing granite before metamorphism and apply directed pressure to that granite, you're going to see black and white banding where all of the crystals have aligned themselves parallel to each other, perpendicular to that stress. Okay. So some metamorphic settings we will see. Contact metamorphism, that was the heat from adjacent rocks, so that was an intruding magma chamber coming up and changing any rocks that it comes in contact with. Hydrothermal metamorphism is when magma is also rising below the ocean. So this happens in a lot of divergent plate boundaries where the two plates are pulling apart and magma is intruding between them. 
but we happen to be under the ocean as well, those rocks that are intruding or that magma that's intruding is changing the temperature of the water. And that water will then alter the rocks that are nearby as well. And so that's hydrothermal metamorphism. And then regional metamorphism, it occurs in the mountain belts. So this is when we see continents collide or we see subduction zones um, from an oceanic continental subduction or convergent. So these will be all of our converging margins. And this is mostly pressure driven. So contact metamorphism is mostly heat driven and regional metamorphism is mostly pressure driven. And then hydrothermal is kind of a low grade mix of the two. Okay, so some metamorphic rocks you might see. So a gneiss is originally an igneous rock, or sorry, a granite is an originally an igneous rock, and it transforms into a gneiss, which is a metamorphic rock. So you might see the term parent rock, mother rock, or protolith. All three of those terms mean the same thing. It just means the original rock before it was a metamorphic rock. Um, a mudstone, which is a sedimentary rock, might turn into a shale. A sandstone, which is also a sedimentary rock, would turn into quartzite. And a limestone, which is also a sedimentary rock, would turn, in, turn into marble. So these are some of the mother or original rocks, and here are the metamorphic rocks that you would see. All right, and the last thing here is the rock cycle. Okay, so the rock cycle is not a one-way street. It goes in basically every direction it can. So we have the basic igneous rock, sedimentary rock, metamorphic rock. Anything that melts and cools will become igneous. So a metamorphic rock can melt and cool and become igneous. A sedimentary rock can melt, cool, and become igneous, okay? Sedimentary rock is made from weathering, erosion, transportation, deposition, becomes sediment, and then burial, compaction, cementation forms the sedimentary rock. So it can come from igneous or it can come from a metamorphic rock. Okay, and then a metamorphic rock can form from heat and pressure. So a sedimentary rock can apply heat and pressure, become metamorphic. We can see more burial of heat and pressure. A metamorphic rock can then become another metamorphic rock. Or an igneous rock can become metamorphic by deep burial and heat and pressure. Okay, so any rock can aspire to be any other rock, and that is the rock cycle. So I hope you guys learned something today, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!